fish will be of many kind. Flowers appear on the earth. The season of singing has come. A voice says, cry out. And I said, what shall I cry? Is it not the Lord against whom we sin? For they would not follow his ways. They did not obey his law. So he poured out on them his burning anger and the violence of war. Who has measured the waters in the hole of his hand? Or with the breadth of his hand, marked off the heavens? He weighs the islands as though they were fine dust. To whom we compare God. What image will you compare him to? Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. Say among the nations, the Lord reigns. Let the heavens rejoice. Let the earth be glad. Let the sea resound. Hello there. Hola. Welcome to Fiji, an armada of 322 islands on tomorrow's side of the International Dateline. This is definitely the most exciting new development in God's work in Fiji. There's no two ways about that. A South Pacific paradise whose elite resorts attract Hollywood's A-list. It's just a blessing to live uh, in Fiji at this time, at this hour, just to experience this new move of God. Eight hundred fifty thousand people are lucky enough to live here permanently. Just over half are ethnic Fijian. The rest are mostly Indians. The Christian community have gone to God in prayer just about everywhere. People have been crying to God for help. They went to God and asked that God would intervene. He's answered our prayers. Now, Fiji is the middle of a full-blown national revival. It is something that we have been longing for for years. We want the church to come together. This great uh, revival spirit that came, this is God's work. It is not human work. We, we just stand in awe when we look at what is happening. Observing Fiji's newfound joy, it is hard to imagine the darkness that gripped the nation just five months after the millennial celebrations. This is the side of paradise tourists don't see. From early tribal days, Fijians have been at war with themselves and with others. And in May 2000, trouble flared afresh. The civil disorders have disrupted our lives like never before. It's to do with the rebellious spirit that uh, had uh, the spirit of sedition, the spirit of, of jealousy and anger and uh, division that's been in us, ingrained in our culture. When the country's first non-Fijian prime minister gained power, a violent coup broke out. When, the, when we had the elections and the in Indians won the elections and they got into power, the Fijians did not like it. The government was held hostage at gunpoint for 56 days by Fijian nationalist George Spate. For about 56 days, they could not get out. 
from the point of the gun. How can we see that our Prime Minister being elected Prime Minister being beaten by thugs? You're talking about a, um, a very extremist group of people who had the power to control this country and their ideology, their ideas were all very frightening. And they were able to, at one point, to sway a good number of our people to their side. Yeah, he's a hero. Radical thoughts led to deadly action. There was a mutiny in our camp where soldiers actually attacked each other. There was uh, uh, killing as well. Queen Elizabeth Barracks, permanent headquarters for Fiji's army. Tension is rising outside. Security is being tightened all over the country. A thousand rounds of .22 ammunition was found at Nandi and the rest of the country. And curfew laws are being extended. Theft and vandalism tore a gaping hole in the nation's infrastructure and psyche. Uh, there was uh, violence in the streets. This is the first time this has happened. And most of the business community has been targeted. It's a disaster. Absolutely shocking. A once robust economy collapsed. Within seven days, tourism arrivals had dropped to a trickle. Australia and New Zealand in particular, it was the headline news for, for weeks. Uh, it was quite devastating. At the moment, the focus will be on the army and which side it decides to support. Marisha Net, BBC News. The nation reached its lowest ebb since it was expelled from the British Commonwealth in the late 1980s. Very worrying situation, especially that once this armed attack on the constitutionally elected government took place and then we saw this rioting in the streets. We've become a nation known to uh, breed um, uh, perpetrators of coup d'etat. And uh, even our soldiers cannot be trusted uh, when they have guns in their hands. That was a very powerful force that was in control of after 56 days in Fiji. It, it must have been one of the most darkest uh, period in our history. It uh, brought uh, right into our faces a situation that we'd never seen before and certainly something we wouldn't like repeated. It was going backwards to the dark ages. There was no normalcy anymore. It was through that political upheaval that there was a lot of soul searching in the heart of a lot of leaders. Why does this happen in our generation? The answer was as painful as the question. When things went wrong with the government, when people were asked, they pointed at the different denominations for causing the split. The churches and the congregations in Fiji were so divided. Togetherness was not there. And all we were doing was saying, we are the best, we are right, they are wrong. And we were pointing fingers at one another. People were going in different directions. They were doing what they wanted to do. It looks as if in every corner of Fiji, in the society we are asking, in provincial council, in parliament, what else? We have tried this and that and that, they're all beat up. Duly alarmed, Fiji's president and senior chiefs called a meeting with church leaders. Their message was courteous, but to the point, denominational disunity was having serious consequences. And the consequences were affecting the entire nation. And a lot of us, you know, we take responsibility you know, of what happened in the nation. Fiji's church had but one place to go, to its knees. There have been long cries of revival and transformation of our people in this country. And individual churches have taken this into their own agenda and tried to work separately from each other. But now, something happened. It has brought us together to put our cry together to the Lord. And this is the cry, the genuine cry of the people from their hearts to put to their God. It was not like just a sobbing, but it was like a wailing where people just cried out, you know, so everywhere people were praying. They knew that if there was to be any solution to Fiji's problem, 
it had to come from God and God alone. When uh, the events of May 2000 happened, there were pastors who got together in the churches uh, and just prayed and prayed and uh, submitted to God and asked for God's forgiveness and for God to help out because I think they too believed that was the last call from God for not just the pastors but for people and our leaders just to humble themselves and, uh, and turn to God. It was on the basis of the prayers of the country through the various denominations that has pulled this country back from the brink of disaster. Fiji needed a miracle, and there was only one person who could provide it. And I believe and very excited that God has intervened in bringing his body together. This is an hour that we will be living for because we know that revival is going to hit, that God is going to heal this nation. Christians began waking up to the fact that cooperation with God and with one another was long overdue. When we see the, the downward spiral of mission, a lot of us, you know, we're able to say, hey, now I think it's time for us to come together. We resolve that we extend uh, invitation to, to all Christian churches or Christian movement in the country for a meeting. It was a moment of truth. Fijian churches were used to steering their own course. Would they actually respond and come together? It was a very short noticed uh, meeting. Uh, it was given out at about 10 o'clock in the morning. The meeting was at 2 o'clock. And I was surprised uh, when we had our first meeting. When he came at 2 o'clock, his office was full of ministers, heads of different denominations. My office was uh, uh, not enough for us. For me, I kept doubting the fact that this could ever happen. I always know from the beginning that uh, one of the missing element you know of the revival of the move of God in the city is the coming together of the body of Christ it wasn't long before this new cooperation took on a new name the Association of Christian Churches in Fiji energized by the spirit this kingdom-minded fellowship was soon extending practical encouragement to scores of projects and institutions. And that uh, for us was, uh, you know, miracle of miracles actually. I mean, we couldn't believe. The story is about the uh, work of the Spirit in the churches. I tell you that uh, this unity came about through prayer. Now we're coming together. It's amazing, the power of prayer. The Methodist Church, the largest denomination in Fiji, was among the first to be swept up in this fresh move of God. We were caught by surprise by the program of God. It was not in the agenda of the Methodist Church that we will work together with our other Christian bodies before the end of uh, 2001. I can still quote the word of the president of the Methodist Church when he said, I really believe heaven is rejoicing because at last, we are together. Before I used to think of myself, but now I realize that I need the other pastors. That if we can work together, unite, we can win our city to Jesus. I just know that it was really born of God. Uh, because the people that we are working together now, it's what you know, it was like uh, we were like uh, a cat and a mouse before. <laughs> You know, so when a cat and a mouse can walk together, <laughs> you know, it's, it's of God. <laughs> In July 2001, this new unity was put on display as Christians from across the nation assembled for three weeks of joint prayer and Bible teaching. At the close of this remarkable gathering, a crowd of nearly 10,000 people assembled in Albert Park to hear from Acting Prime Minister Lysenia Gase. Being a month away from national elections, he could have used the speech to solicit votes. He didn't. The greatest need of all, though, is to put our nation right in the eyes of God. Our efforts towards building this country will come to nothing if they are not rooted firmly 
in the love and fear of God. Instead, he used the occasion to humble himself before God and the nation. So I stand here, stripped of office. I am not, at this moment, a political leader. What you see and what the Lord sees is just a person, someone in need of God's forgiveness. I ask him to forgive me for the times I have been neglectful and cold in my relationship with him. With your guidance, this sinner will renew himself, will find new strength and new purpose in the pursuit of will. Lord, I entreat you again to save me, to capture my heart and take my hand. I honor you as the King of Kings. I know him personally. So when he stood up that day and made that confession, we were all taken by surprise. I wouldn't be able to do the job at all without God's help. And uh, I will never forget that evening too. Uh, as I stood there, the church ministers, I think there were about three or four of them, uh, their hands on my shoulders and uh, they prayed for me. And uh, it, it was the most significant moment uh, in my life and I could feel that uh, the Lord was, was looking through me and uh, without that there is no way I can run uh, the, the affairs of this country. Sensing a spiritual electricity in the air, Christians began to pray for the approaching elections. We start praying for the next government, that's just before the election. We pushed back the power of darkness. I could feel that uh, uh, there was a change happening, and a very positive change. Four weeks later, Gaudese's fledgling SDL party won the election. It was a big surprise because it was the newest, newest of parties. We formed the party uh, three or four months before the general elections. It was the prayers that broke through. It was the power of prayer. It could only happen by divine intervention. I, I, I can't explain it any other way. Standing quietly behind this godly invasion of government is Fiji's president, Ratu Josefa Ilo Ilo. We have God-fearing leaders in the person of His Excellency the President. He's such a humble man. In a formal statement read before Sentinel Group cameras in December 2001, the president reiterated his belief that God's hand of grace and protection was heavy upon the nation. I believe this is God's time to bring about revival in this country. But in an unscripted moment afterwards, it was evident this grace was being felt in a deeply personal way. Do, do you have a sense of, of God's hand and calling upon your life now as you're leading the nation? It was an eloquent silence. That's a very touching one. The moment I saw him, God spoke to me and said, this is the president, the leader of the nation you've been praying for. I'm sitting here. Until recently, Josefa Rombono served as a presidential watchman. It was a role that granted him unique access to the first family's personal living quarters. Every morning, the president always wake up at about 4.30, putting his full coat, not the pajamas, sitting down in his own bed, having a time of fellowship with God every morning. It's every morning. Joined by a cluster of godly aides, the president and first lady called forth the purposes of heaven. God, I want you to handpick the government leaders in this election. Your finger, handpick. God's response was quick in coming. And everybody, we begin to see those results. With a new man at the helm, the government started taking on a new face. And we have a lot of people in cabinet, I am just so pleased to say, who are born again Christians. It's just the finger of God and it's what the Lord is doing. Taito Wonga Vakatonga was a local pastor. Now he is the president of the Senate. This is the power of prayer. I, I was uh, nominated where I am now, it's just because of prayer, just because of him. Apa Salome Tundreo, another humble man of God, 
was tapped to head up the newly created Ministry of Reconciliation. But that's our challenge. We have to get our leaders, the professional leaders, the religious leaders, the political leaders, to see that one vision. Andi Azanatha Thauthau was the last candidate to win a seat in the 2001 elections. But God and the nation were waiting for her. Now an active member of the Prime Minister's Cabinet, Thauthau's extended portfolio includes responsibility for women, poverty alleviation, and social welfare. I'm just ripe to pass on the Word of God. And I have no hesitation at all in sharing the Word of God with just anybody, and even in trying to get them to receive salvation. And I do that in the house. In all my speeches, I would start off by praising the Lord God, by giving glory to Jehovah. With a united church and a government teeming with godly servants, Fiji has begun to recover its spiritual heritage. A lot of people never wanted to go to church, but I begin to see them. They want to. They ask me, when I is the revival? A revival torch commissioned by President Ilo Ilo at the Albert Park Rally has been slowly making its way through the Fijian archipelago. Many towns and villages have greeted it with great emotion. When they, they carry the touch around, the chief, you know, they, they were crying. Everybody was so emotional about it and they were saying, it is like, you know, the, the light coming to our soul. It's like the gospel coming to our soul for the first time. We see that the fire of God was able to, to be spread, you know, uh, throughout the nation. The whole of the Fiji group will be given back to the Lord. That's what I want to see. Fire has not always stirred hope within the Fijian soul. In an earlier but not so distant age, its flickering light illumined fearful rituals and unspeakable horror. The land groaned under the weight of superstition and sorcery. Ancestral spirits roamed freely, promising abundance and demanding their due. By the side of the temple, great heaps of human bones lay whitening in the sun. Priests convulsed and spoke in strange voices. It was a world where chiefs held absolute power. The lives of commoners hung on their prevailing mood or appetite. Women were given as tribute or taken as a prize of war. Tribal fighting was gruesome and fruit. Fueled by revenge and greed, violent warriors depopulated entire villages, even islands. Fallen enemies were carried off the battlefield on poles, long pigs to be cooked and eaten. Worse still, these cannibalistic instincts were sometimes directed at the living in an act of appalling cruelty. Fijian chiefs occasionally ordered doomed victims to cut firewood to roast their own bodies. According to reports from early Methodist missionaries, the royal capital of Bao stank for days as human flesh was cooked in every hut. Even when the days of cannibalism had passed, the power of the fire remained. On the island of Benga, the Suwau clan lived under the sway of Menahuni-like spirits, known as Veili. At the edge of Rakua village, clan priests filled the Lovo pits with hot stones and began to walk on them. This is one of the villages that perform witchcraft to that great level, to the high, highest degree. Witchcraft was really strong in the village. That's where the big Lovo was. Penny Sorowali, 
high priest of the Sawal clan, began treading fire at the age of 15. As I began to walk on the hot stones, I never felt any heat at all. A veli were summoned to observe each performance. Before this ceremony, normally go up to the mountain where these people live, the demons. We took a basket and filled it with two kinds of leaves. So they will bring the demons down to the village. The basket is placed carefully under the priest's bed. And sometimes in the night they can hear the chanting of these demons. While Rukua's firewalkers had been granted protection from searing stones, these powers came at a cost. There was a curse upon this village. A lot of the people, you know, they were dying and they, they don't know what's the cause of it. Most of them, they died outside of their home and uh, that brought fear into their hearts. Silasa Rongongo was a big time drug dealer. I used to plant uh, marijuana. He was in the very depth of it. Police people couldn't even track him down. I just plant in big, uh, big amount and I keep it, hide it in the bush. And he told me a place where he used to dig and put the dried leaves in a bottle, waiting for those from overseas to come by yacht. After the cyclone season, the illicit cargo ships arrive in every direction, including Asia, Oceania, and North America. In 1999, one of Rongongo's friends, a notorious drinker named George Ponati, developed a serious medical condition. My leg, my left hand leg, I went up to Suba and she's a private doctor. After examining Ponapati, the doctor scheduled an operation for the following week. He had that fear of death coming to him. But death would have to wait. Two days before Ponapati's scheduled surgery, a concerned acquaintance made arrangements for him to visit a thriving Suva area church. Then he came to the prayer ministry where he was prayed over. Divine power surged through his diseased body. When I went to hospital, nothing, nothing wrong with my head. He brought the testimony to this village how the Lord has healed him. As soon as he came back from town, he told me straight away about uh, what happened to his knee. I'm a church now. No more drink. The impact of this work of grace was immediate. A lot of people responded and gave their hearts to the Lord. What happened here, like a household salvation, came upon them. So that confirmed me to make the whole family change. So that when we change, I can know the, the, the way to, to cast out the demons anytime. So the demons never come again. <laughs> Penny Sorwali also felt the enchantment lifting. When I received Jesus as Savior, everything changed. I began to realize that for all these years, I had been lied to by the devil. This revelation led the Suwao clan to sever their long-standing pact with the Veli. All the priests have stopped the fire walking. We have all been born again by the power of the Holy Spirit. We have seen the power, the impact of the gospel in this village. In 80 or 90 percent of the people in this village are going to church. They just love to hear the teaching of the word of the Lord. No more grog, no more smoke, no more marijuana, no more stealing. Even Rukua's infamous drug dealer has been swept up in the transforming tide. Now I come to realize that uh, we should be faithful to the words of God, eh? to follow the words of God. For me to see him, that man before, to me it's really great. To live with God every day, eh? it's amazing. Encouraged by these developments, but not content, village elders have maintained a vigil before the Lord. So we have been praying every day, four o'clock in the morning. We have been praying for the Lord to move in. And by all appearances, God has been obliging. I used to be a sick man, always I get sick. When uh, I was changed, I never get sick again. And even 
We have some old men, they're supposed to be dead long time ago. Now they look young and they're so healthy. When the national economy tumbled in the wake of the May 2000 coup, Rakua's fortunes began to rise. When people say that the economy goes down, but here in this village, money start to come up. A new community center is being built with funds donated by the owner of a nearby resort. The prayer has power. We can see and we can feel the change. The breath of God has even revived the land and sea. We can see the fruit coming every, every season. Eh? Trees that used not to bear fruits start bearing fruits now. And we've seen also in the sea the fish that we don't normally get every season in one year. Now it's coming in. Rakua's essential reef has sprung back to life. People start to run and see, yes, start coming up. New corals, out of the dead corals, new ones start coming up. And you can see the white thing on the, on the coral, just like a flower. The power of the transformation of the gospel of Jesus Christ has brought all this. Today, this transforming power is being felt across the nation. We have about more than 40,000 uh, members, you know, uh, all over the nation, and the church is still growing. For months now, Fijians of all backgrounds have been flooding into the kingdom. There are lots of people who are coming up at every meeting that we have. Hundreds of people have been turning up. Oh, people are coming, you know, in, in thousands. The ground is filled with people. There's just a strong desire for God in this nation right now. In September 2003, this hunger was on public view at an open-air crusade held by German evangelist Reinhard Bonke. On the final night, there was about 120,000 people that came to that meeting. So that was about 10% uh, of the population of Fiji. Thousands came to the world, hundreds of people. Fiji's Indian community is also displaying an appetite for fresh spiritual experience. In late 2002, the nation's Indo-Fijian pastors held their first ever prayer breakfast to consider a response. And they were challenging each other, you know, to go for the harvest. They said, you know, uh, our people are ready for Jesus. Many are responding to a flurry of recent and remarkable healings. And they see these miracles and the news goes out that Jesus can do it. I'm from a very strong Hindu background. My father was a priest in Hinduism. But when Suman Lata's six-year-old daughter, Kavita, contracted painful and blinding eye ulcers, her faith was put to the test. Every month I used to visit the doctors. I go, doctors give me only the ointment. It was a routine she would follow for 18 years. And there's no cure around the world. Finally, feeling betrayed by the medical establishment and her Hindu gods, Suman took Kavita to a nearby church for prayer. And on the third day, she started to see. And Kavita was healed, and even we took her to New Zealand for her medical checkup. The doctors say no more Elsa, no more nothing. And then from then on, we all our family, myself, my husband, I've got three kids, we all converted to Christian. And Suman's story is not unique. Among the Indians of Fiji, there is a great revival. There is tremendous growth in the churches, especially the Indian churches. A lot of people in Fiji, they are changing to Christianity, a lot. People have sensed this is the peak hour of searching God. Now when, the, when one family member gets saved, the whole family comes to know the Lord. I believe there is a wave of God that is coming over this nation. God is moving in a different way altogether like he has never before. This glorious torrent has not only swept up hundreds of hopeful Indo-Fijians, but also the elite commandos 
whose actions in the spring of 2000 nearly extinguished that hope. Our work covers uh, all the 14 prisons, including the Nukulau Island, where the coup leaders of uh, May 2000 uh, are held right now. Apo Rangethi, a chaplain with prison fellowship, was there from the beginning. In the early days, uh, there was really not much hope. There was a lot of uh, fear and a lot of um, uncertainty. They were closed up. They did not uh, speak to us. The first three or four Sundays when I walked into these people, 40 of them, you could feel, you could sense in your spirit, you couldn't discern the hatred in their hearts, the unforgiveness, the hardness of their hearts, the stony hearts, the revenge deep within them. You could feel that. Did you desert that squadron <laughs> to be here? Um, maybe yes, uh, maybe no, but uh, in some way I'm fighting for my country and for my people. That's what the army for. We Fijians run our own government, then I die or executed for what I've done. It's, it's okay for me. I've done my part. They knew they were very, uh, it was a very serious case that they are involved, you know, with the mutiny. By early 2001, God's deep and persistent love had begun to do its work. One by one, these proud, tough soldiers surrendered afresh. In the dim light of Suva and Nukalau prisons, they renounced forever their mutinous attempts to rule their own hearts. It was, in the words of one spirit-filled prison warden, a clean sweep. He was saying that everybody who came in uh, gave their hearts to the Lord. And they are new men now behind bars. You hear them singing their heart out to the Lord, singing hallelujah chorus. I'm so glad I belong to Jesus. I will serve no other foreign God with tears running down their cheeks. People drive past this prison. If they don't know this is uh, the prison, they think it's a, a church inside here. No eyes will come out dry in that prison. Just uh, the presence of the Lord is there. Even the infamous coup master George Spate has reportedly been soundly converted. And I can uh, testify that, uh, that George has uh, experienced uh, radical transformation in his life. Every week when I, we go there, he is consistently in the Word, reading and just praising the Lord. While the spiritual progress inside Fiji's prisons has been gratifying, the work on the outside has proven more of a challenge for local Christians. Indians throughout the nation were so much in fear. They were panicking. They, they sensed that uh, they were just made outcasts. They were the target of abuse. And that brought a lot of fear among the Indians at the time of the coup. One month into the coup, church leaders called for a national day of prayer and repentance. Despite being under martial law, nearly 5,000 people showed up, including 167 Indian retailers whose shops had been looted or vandalized. We all came and faced them and knelt before them. You know, it was electrifying. Everybody just broke out and they were groaning everywhere. It's the church that actually has a part to play because it changes the people, the community, as no other system can. I would like to see our nation grow in reconciliation with all the peoples of Fiji, but that is only possible through prayers. Let's bring harmony and peace and joy back in the nation as Fiji was. Of course, in a society shattered by racism and violence, it is not enough to simply talk about God's love. Now there is uh, a new, you know, it's a new heart uh, in the society. And uh, they are able to uh, see the effect of Christianity. This visible faith has lately seen Fijian Christians helping their Indian neighbors to repair shops, replant farms, and obtain necessary social services. And people are beginning to take notice. So uh, people are coming back to their senses. There's a lot of talks about reconciliation and this a uh, lot of action about reconciliation, which is definitely a big help. I use taxis a lot. And when I ride in a taxi, there's always an Indo-Fijian driving. 
the way he's talking and the way we converse now, I know that they've been touched by what God is doing in this nation. Indeed, evidence of God's healing hand can be seen all across the nation. Reduction of poverty, reduction of beggars on the streets, reduction of street kids. I see all the children going to school. Crime is also under divine assault. When Christians in one troubled neighborhood discovered the government lacked resources to combat mounting theft, they took to the streets in prayer. Uh, after a few weeks of this, the police force uh, found there was a drop in crime rate. There was crime outside those areas, but not within. If we are to change people in their performance and activities, we have to change them from inside. Change, of course, is a divine specialty. When God takes up residence in the human heart, the inevitable consequence is irrepressible joy. You go down the streets and people are smiling. Uh, yeah, that didn't happen 12 months ago. You see the smile, big ear to ear smile that I never used to see. I'm so happy. This doesn't mean that Fiji has become an untrammeled paradise. We are still a long way yet to go. I would like people to be lifted out of poverty. With one quarter of the country living in poverty, Asa Natha Thao Thao has a tough job. She also has an impressive source of strength. Every morning, I just cast all my burden onto the Lord and I invite the Holy Spirit to lead me. He never fails. But Fiji's economy has shown signs of a new vitality. It's recovering much, much faster. So fast, it's unbelievable. Things have improved a lot. A lot of industries have uh, are coming back into the country. The tourists, the visitors are coming back and they're filling the hotels. Our import figures have shown, uh, reflected well, which means our retail, our retail sales have shown a lot of improvement. Uh, banks are having more confidence in us. According to the report made by the Reserve Bank, we, we are moving forward. So right now, we can say that we are in definitely a much better situation. We have done rather well. Uh, much, much better than what we thought uh, originally. The reason is because there are men and women of God out there who are leading the nation. So next year, we expect a, a, a boom year again. If this country is to become a good country, say a wealthy country, a better country, it must remain in God. And we must walk that way where God wants us to walk. Rural society represents Fiji's front line in the battle for prosperity. The village of Sambeto located in the shadow of some of the nation's poshest resorts, is a prime exhibit. Despite the best efforts of local elders, pastors, and school teachers, living standards have continued to deteriorate. So what's wrong? Uh, before, when I heard the story, this village was plenty of food. Now it's very hard to see a kind of food, uh, no source of income. Sensing their lack may be linked to spiritual unfaithfulness, many villagers are turning their attention heavenward. We know that there, there's no other source of getting this back, uh, back to normal. We know, as the Bible says. There's only one way, as Jesus said. He's the only way, and he's the only truth, and he's the only life. What you're seeing here tonight is that is a trend it's a new thing altogether and it is almost spreading like wildfire right right around the country other cries for divine help have been echoing through the blood-stained Natasori highlands Vunyani Nakayatha a Suva air pastor who grew up in the region has seen the village go through decades of social upheaval even before that there was a practice of witchcraft in the area The village come to a point, you know, there, were, there was no, uh, you know, relationship was breaking. The, the damage was really, you know, affecting the, the village. 
A similar situation has been brewing on the island of Nairai, some 100 miles to the east. There was so much evil and, um, here in the village. Located in the turbulent Koro Sea, the island hosts six villages, including the coastal community of Tovu Lailai. Of course, there was a lot of poverty and difficulties and unhappiness and a fighting amongst themselves. Unproductive soil and a dying reef had nearly strangled the village food supply. That particular village, they, they, there was no fish. For 55 years, they had not seen this fish, which they called their own. In the early 60s, Nuku's spring-fed water became a toxic witch's brew, killing nearby crops and causing debilitating brain lesions. It was midday when the water turned white and every one of us who was swimming in the river had to you know, flee. As the decades passed, Nuku's problems mounted. Finally, in the spring of 2003, the people had had enough. They came to me and uh, we, 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 we decided, oh, well, what shall we do? I said, well, we, we should go to God about it. We had our tribal meeting at the shed over there and everyone from neighboring villages came to it. Everybody just confessed and identified the sins of our forefathers and all the tribal warfare, the bloodshed and witchcraft, which uh, was, was a powerful time. The solemn assembly, which for days preempted all other activities, lasted from 9 a.m. until midnight. People would weep for four to five hours, you know, crying out on God and falling on their faces. Over in Tovu Lailai, an identical cleansing unfolded under the guidance of Methodist Bible teacher Inosi Vono. He prepared the hearts, the minds, and the souls of the people through the Word of God and through consultations with, um, with the members of the community. And then if they want the new to come, with is Jesus, then they have to clean all the, the old things out. So this working in the villages where people are just turning to God, bringing all the idols and all the witchcraft uh, things, and, and seeking the face of God, praying and fasting. That's, that's new. Traditional chiefs, which still command significant influence in Fijian society, are increasingly at the forefront of this spiritual resurgence. A member of Fiji's Senate and Great Council of Chiefs, Ratu George Maivalili, presides over the largest district in the nation. I um, had a meeting with all my chiefs. I want you to go to every tribe. I want the cleansing from family to family, tribes to tribes, and clan to clans. We will do it together as people to the Lord. In January 2004, the Fijian government took matters a step further by commissioning an official year of prayer. Citizens were asked to observe the occasion by setting aside at least one week to reconcile broken relationships. The people should repent first and then reconcile with one another. They have to change the old covenant to a new covenant with God. The catalyst is the presence of God. And I'm excited. I'm excited to see that what the Lord is going to do to completely transform my people. Although Fijians are starting to recognize the link between spiritual intimacy and societal health, their engagement from old loves is far from complete. We've given up uh, cannibalism, but uh, there's certain other ways. The worship of ancestral gods, for instance, is still here. In places like Nambu Tau Tau, a small village in the rain-soaked interior of Fiji's main island, this failure to clean house has been costly. Filimoni Nawawa Balavu is the paramount chief of the seven villages of Nova Tusila. He is also the great-grandson of the chief responsible for one of the most infamous acts in Fijian history. It seems like we're slaves to the, what the wrong what we did. Although the region is lushly tropical, vegetation around Nambu Tau Tau is scant, and villagers still hunt for food. 
as of late 2003, the village had no electricity. Its children were required to walk 24 kilometers to the nearest school. Many believe Navatasila's woes are linked to the fate of Wesleyan missionary Thomas Baker. Born in East Sussex, Baker received his commission to Fiji on the 5th of April, 1859. His wife was nervous about his bold journeys into the interior. I think much about you and the little ones, especially Alice. I do not fear the natives, and we hope to do them good. Kiss the children for me, all of them, and tell them to pray for me. If I can accomplish this, I shall be the lion of the day. It seems clear the intrepid missionary had a premonition of what was to come. I thought Fiji had not yet stained its shores with a missionary's blood. Am I to be the first? Before he prepared for bed, Thomas Baker offered prayers in the presence of the villagers. An aide noticed lights moving toward the village as Baker slept. A nearby chief had sent word that he wanted the missionary dead. The fateful morning was bright and clear but the land was yet in darkness. In this area, the club and the old gods still ruled. When Baker spotted an unusual number of armed men converging on Nambu Tau Tau, he knew he was in trouble. Let's, let's be quick or we should be killed. But it was too late. A short distance from the village, Baker and his Fijian co-workers were fatally ambushed by 30 warriors, wielding clubs and long-handled battle axes. Seeing the fallen missionary, an old woman named Messima came out of her hut bearing a flask of coconut oil. The woman begged that the body not be put to its usual purpose prophesying that such an evil deed would bring a curse upon the village. In the end, her warnings went unheeded. In November 2003, the villages of Navatusila, still restless in their hearts, set out to achieve the cleansing and freedom that had so long eluded them. As the villagers continued their business with God, hundreds of spectators and international journalists were arriving for the main event. It was time to welcome the descendants of the Reverend Thomas Baker. I accept this gift of, of welcome from the people of Fiji and from this village uh, with honor. This would be a moment that we have all come to witness here in this 2003 with uh, the presence of the Prime Minister of our nation, the Honorable Laisen Yangarase. This gathering will be long remembered in the annals of Fiji. Here, in this isolated part of our country, high in the interior, a great tragedy was played out all those long years ago. It has echoed down the ages, carrying guilt and remorse to successive generations. Now, we have come to lay it to rest. An important part of this process is the Osoro, a traditional act of public humility and confession. When it came time to put the apology into words, Chief Nawawa Balavu stepped forward to face the family of the man his people had slaughtered.
One by one, the victim's progeny extended the forgiveness that Nova Tassila has sought for more than a century. I accept your apology. I offer my forgiveness. You are forgiven. I believe today's events can free the people of Fiji to achieve their destiny. At the end of the day, there was a sense that something remarkable had happened. I guess also when I came here, I was expecting this to be a, some sort of closure, not only for those, but for us. But to find that this is not the end, uh, this is not a, a final chapter of a book, it's, it's another chapter of a book. The chains of guilt and bitterness had finally come off. I talk freely, like walk freely like a free man. And not only me, all the families. Although the details of Navatusila's turnaround have yet to be recorded, no one doubts they will be consistent with God's character. When we prepare in, in the right way, I mean, if we follow the right way, and then really we, we will meet him. In Nuku, God's presence brought instant healing to waters poisoned for more than four decades. Just like that. It's uh, beyond us. We can't believe it. Uh, it's uh, too good to be true. You could see right on the river banks here. This is to die. Is to you know just wither. But now the grass is coming back, and uh, even back here you could see you know uh, this this is uh, was not even growing properly. And you could see back there people are planting taro closer to the bank of the river, which uh, you know was was not uh, done before. And the fish start coming in. Drawn by the Lord of the Seas, the fish are returning to Tovo Lai Lai as well. Just after the church service in the morning, and they saw the, the fish coming towards the sand. How many fish did you count? Tolu, three, 3,957. They started loading it into the boat and just praise God and thank God. Because this was an unusual event. It was a great witness. It was a miracle. It had never happened before. But they just started dancing out from wherever they were. And they were shouting and singing and dancing. A powerful realignment is underway. The healing of the land is starting to emerge. We believe in a God that can do wonders like this. There's prosperity out there. Because God is working, the people are turning to God, and God is healing the land. In villages like Tovu Lai Lai, the word abundance has re-entered the local vocabulary. It's not only the fish. There are crabs in the mangroves. Those were the biggest crab I've ever seen. You know, they don't come that south. <laughs> like in Rukua, there's also restoration of land, eh? the land itself bearing fruit. Trees that have been growing and not bearing fruit are just buried. The community has totally been transformed within a year, less than a year. And the secret of their success is getting out. For the other villages, it was a miracle. They believed then that as a result of the cleansing that happened here, the spiritual cleansing, this is what God will do. Uh, over 60% of our people live on the land. And when they saw that, they realized that uh, uh, if they could only turn to God, what they thought was uh, uh, dry land, land has been used up, was still there for God to bless, but it was up to them to change their ways, then God would heal their land. I, they asked me at the Council of Chiefs, hey, what you doing? I said, I'm giving my land back to the Lord. Why? Because it's his in the first place. <laughs> As Fiji's environment continues to respond to God's touch, even seasoned observers are expressing amazement. I attended a workshop only last week. People came from 11 out of the 14 provinces, and they could not understand 
how this was all happening in 23 fishing grounds from 11 provinces. Uh, they were sharing with each other, then they realized that the hand of God was upon all these fishing grounds. The fish that I never used to see has begun to come out. The fish, that same kind of fish, they were small one like this, now they are big like this. And just lately I came from my village. I used to grow bananas, but the bananas before used to be about like this. You know, like this, they are bigger than this. This is a change that I, I tell my wife, hey, the Lord is really blessing us. It's begun to take change. He's healing the land. They have this particular selfish, which if you go out and collect some, you won't be able to get any more for several months. Then you'd only get a few. But now they go daily to collect and they're sexful. Isn't it just so amazing? According to eyewitness reports, these eco-miracles are typically preceded by a two-step pattern. Repentant villagers extend offerings of soil and seawater, usually at the end of a collective fast. And God responds by sending a token of his acceptance. In nearly every case, this sign takes the form of a sudden rain shower, divine precipitation that falls without heed to the prevailing weather. God always shows a miracle straight after. If the sun is shining brightly, what happens? There will be rain. I think God revealing himself in this way and showing people his power. And uh, it never happened before. Something wonderful is on the move. So I, I, I know, I just believe that uh, Fiji is undergoing the process of being transformed. And it is through the power of prayer. This is the day that I have been praying for, the day that I have dreamt for. God is uh, he's definitely having a hand in the affairs of our country. Revival has come to Fiji. God moved through Fiji uh, like uh, a wildfire back here with our ancestors in the 1800s. We've only read about it. Now it's starting to move again. It's just like an open heaven that just happened recently, you know. We, c we can sense that uh, we're already on the new time, yes. the new days of the Lord. Yeah. The power of the gospel, transforming people, transforming uh, family, transforming community, and even also transforming uh, the nation. After decades of mutual neglect, Fiji's church and state have entered into a healthy and harmonious partnership. The church has come to do things that we know we can do, and the government has actually also responded. And now they start to, to acknowledge the role of the church in, in the building of the nation. The prime minister is not shy about setting an example. Our prime minister, this morning's news, he was just announcing over the radio that the church should be helping the state. That was this morning's news. So I see the role of the church is so vital in nation building. And uh, I see that the gospel, you know, is the very foundation upon which a society is built. The story of Fiji is that of a church released to the fullness of its calling. A church spilled out into every arena of human life and endeavor. God is the God of all. He's the God of politics. He's the God of business. He's the God of the church. Is the God of what the Fijians call the Panua, which means the people and the land. So whatever I'm doing as a businessman, as a politician, a teacher or a doctor, in all works of life, whatever I am doing, that can be called my act of worship to God. And worship in that sense is not confined to the four corners of the church or what we do only on Sunday. It is the whole activities of man within 24 hours to be given to God for his glory and for his praise. If we do that, then this is heaven. It's heaven. As their faith increases, Fijians are beginning to see what God can do, even through their own story. I believe that God is raising up Fiji in this hour as a model of His grace to be broadcast through the entire world. The spirit of jealousy is going. The, the spirit of anger and sedition, of division, is moving out of our lives. And I believe if the rest of the world can see that, then at least something God has done in Fiji would be of benefit to the rest of the world. And we just really believe that this is our turn. 
to take the gospel from Fiji and to other Pacific Islands. Indeed, there is evidence that revival embers have already begun to scatter, most notably throughout the western Solomon Islands and in the neighboring country of Vanuatu. Like Fiji, these nations have suffered long under the crushing weight of superstition, poverty, and political instability. In October 2002, Vanuatu's fortunes took a dramatic turn for the better. In a nationally televised speech, Prime Minister Edward Notape delivered a forceful repudiation of witchcraft and idolatry. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by the power of the blood of Jesus Christ, I renounce the worship of evil gods. I renounce the covenants with evil spirits and demonic powers. I renounce all their actions and worship of idols and evil spirits and evil gods. With the audience hanging on his every word, the Prime Minister concluded with a remarkable declaration. I, the Prime Minister of Vanuatu, today on behalf of the people and the Republic of Vanuatu, make this covenant with the Almighty God. One, we acknowledge you as the one and true and only true God. Two, we acknowledge you as the only God in whom Vanuatu stands. Three, we acknowledge the Lord Jesus Christ as our personal Lord and Savior. Four, we acknowledge the power and the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives and in the nation of Vanuatu. I also this day pledge our allegiance to honor and serve no other gods but God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Almighty God, I, the Prime Minister, submit the nation into your mighty hands. Thirteen months after this spiritual watershed, George Sakumanu, Vanuatu's first head of state, boldly urged the nation's lawmakers to surrender their lives to Jesus. Many did so, and today they are presiding over a season of unprecedented political calm. Awed by Jehovah's transforming presence, Fiji's faithful make no attempt at articulate speech. You cannot really explain it without God. Each of our prayer requests have been answered. It is amazing. To me, it is a joy and a privilege to be part of what God is doing. I believe, we believe that the best is yet to come. I wish I could live another 30 more years. I, I can see the, the tremendous opportunity uh, that we have right now. Uh, God is enabling the church, maybe for the last of fancy. I think he's preparing the world for the return of Jesus Christ. If Fiji's eager obedience takes wing to the nations, that day may not be far off. The, the turnaround happened so quickly, in the matter of months. It's almost something that's happening immediately. We pray now, it happens now. That, that is how we feel. And this is the time that uh, what the prophets were talking about. There's going to be new things. There's a new wave. There's a new wind coming now. Total upside down change. It's a new day for Fiji. It's half a struggle with this coming. <laughs> I just praise God. I just praise God that that's uh, what he's doing and there's nothing else. <laughs> there's nothing else to do, nothing else to talk about except that.